to welcome everybody and uh, to this evening's event, which has been brought to you by the 9-11 Truth Alliance, who got word that Susan was coming to town and needed a place, and so we uh, arranged the Lucky Lab as a uh, suitable venue for her kind of talk and book selling, signing event, and I just want to... Uh, spend a few moments and just talk about uh, the 9-11 Truth Alliance and what we've been up to and what's coming up and uh, then briefly introduce Susan and get this talk underway. And I assume, you know, you'll talk for a little while and then there'll be some oh, discussion. Oh, yeah. lots of questions. Yeah. Anything you want to ask, okay. we'll, talk, we'll stay and well, talk. All right. Um, and I'm glad you said that because I think that's a real hallmark of the 9-11 Truth Alliance. It's uh, the thing that's really special about the 9-11 Truth Alliance is that it um, insists on free thinking and free speech and critical thinking. And it really reacts quickly to gatekeepers. And when, you know, these phrases come up, you know, and a lot of people don't know what they mean offhand, but once you've studied uh, the events of 9-11-2001, it's been almost 10 years now, one realizes that, um, you know, there are all these cliches that you can throw up, you know, we're in the <laughs> Matrix, it's 1984, it's all sorts of uh, highly controlled, highly uh, spectacle is being thrown at the public in a very coordinated and nefarious manner in a way to get the populations of the world to be docile and not think and be afraid and do what they're told and not speak out. And the 9-11 Truth Alliance is one of the few groups that refuses to stop speaking out and to stop thinking. And so by coming here tonight, you're part of this tradition of enlightenment and resistance and truth seeking. That's kind of been the hallmark of a lot of the higher cultures of this planet and it's a real disappointment that we seem to be entering this period in which uh, truth and enlightenment, far from being cherished, are being stamped out with uh, the likes of Guantanamo and any, any other torture chamber you care to name. So, Anyway, if you want to talk about these things, you can come to the 9-11 Truth Alliance meetup meeting, which uh, every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock at the True Brew Coffee House, which is on southeast Milwaukee, just south of Powell Boulevard, on the east side of the street. I don't remember the exact address. It's um, right there. We meet at 11 for, I don't know, as long as people want to talk, really. And then uh, we also attempt to put together some other events and things. Uh, coming up, of course, is the 10th anniversary of 9-11, 10 years of war and torture and ripping up the Constitution and crashing the economy, and here we are. And uh, we're about to be treated to a media bloodbath in which they're gonna rev it all up again, maybe this time for Iran. And, um, We'll be doing our counter events. We're gonna. We've. Um, it looks like we will have Jim Fetzer, who has talked about 9/11 also for a real long time, and he'll be speaking on Friday the 9th, and I believe it's going to be at the Selwood Middle or the Selwood Community Center down in uh, Southeast Portland this month. This September. Oh, September. September. And then on Saturday, uh, in the same building, we hope to have kind of an all-day seminar for beginners and then for more advanced people on uh, the ins and outs of 9-11. I mean, there have been all these fabulous documentaries done about 9-11, all kinds of documentaries done. I mean, there's information up to the wazoo about it, books, etc., etc. It all doesn't appear to pierce the hardcore media grip on reality, but uh, we're going to talk about it anyway. And uh, it's down in the Selwood Community Center, and we're here in the Lucky Lab because uh, the 9-11 Truth Alliance has experienced the backlash of truth-telling in this town. 
Uh, we've had various different events, and we've been chased out of venues time and time again. Chased out of venues, uh, one after another, and you know this is the reality of where we are right now. I mean, uh, liberal friends who we thought were liberal friends turned out to just be liberals, <laughs> and uh, they appear to be just as more in favor of Obama and bombing Libya and attacking Yemen and you know, shredding the Constitution and instituting, you know, rendition here in the United States, and I guess employing Guantanamo tactics at Pelican Bay and other supermax prisons now in the United States where there's a hunger strike which you also wouldn't know about unless you like kept your ear extremely close to the ground. I mean Pelican Bay, our very own Guantanamo, is actually just over the border in California from Oregon so it's not even just a few hundred miles from here and they're torturing people right now, right there. So anyway, it's a dark time, but I'm really happy that we're still able to practice our free speech rights and have a speaker like... For now. For now, for like Susan Lindauer, who has had her own story to tell of being in the fold of the uh, national security state and then kind of being kicked into the hole for not going along with it. Yeah. And um, I'm really excited to hear her talk about it. I've heard a few of the prices she's had to pay with her family and others, so it's like, whenever you really start telling the truth, you've got, I mean, you know, I hate to be so doom and gloom, but you've got to be prepared for the consequences. There are some serious consequences. And, uh, but at the same time, keep in mind that it's not all about now, it's never always been about now. We're, we're dealing with the future now, and we're fighting for the future. And, you know, that's where we're at, so here we go. Thank you. I have to say, I am so pleased to be here. I have waited 10 years, 10 years to tell this story. Uh, I remember after 9-11 when my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, told me that uh, there really wasn't going to be much of a 9-11 investigation. And we were going to try to keep the people calm. That's what he said. We're going to keep them calm. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, he said, well, we don't really need them to know everything that we were doing before 9-11. And I said, well, why? <laughs> what do you think what do, what do you think's going to happen when they find out that you didn't tell them the truth? Why don't you just tell them the truth right now? And he said, well, that's not really what they want to do. So I had, uh, and, and uh, I had different ideas. Uh, I will tell you straight off the bat that Right after 9-11, my CIA handler received a $13 million payoff from the 9-11 investigation that was supposed to be money used for the Iraqi, uh, to secure Iraq's cooperation. And I ended up getting indicted on the Patriot Act. I was the second non-Arab American ever indicted on the Patriot Act after Jose Padilla. And my crime was in opposing terrorism and, and going to Congress. And I had spoken to the staff of Senator John McCain and Senator Trent Lott, and I had pounded them. I called their chiefs of staff, their legislative directors, and their foreign policy people. And I said, I wanna, I'm, I'm an asset who covered Iraq and Libya at the United Nations. And I have a story to tell, and you need to hear what I have to say. And within 30 days, I am not making this up. This is actually, doc thanks to the Patriot Act, uh, <laughs> uh, all of my phone calls to these offices are taped by the FBI, so I can actually prove that they occurred. And I have the dates, I have the, phone, I have the actual phone conversations on tape. Uh, and within 30 days of those conversations, I woke up to hear the FBI pounding at my door, and I got up out of bed and I looked out the window and there are men in flak jackets in my porch. And I open the door and I, they, they come into my house and they're like, Ms. Susan, and the FBI agent is shaking. He's shaking. And he said, uh, you are Susan Lindauer, you are hereby notified, you are under arrest on the Patriot Act. And I said, what? You, may, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say, et cetera, et cetera. He read me my Miranda rights and I was just like, 
what are you talking about? I'm making coffee. <laughs> you know, I'm not a bank robber. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a murderer. I haven't broken any laws that I can think of. And, and I have no idea what you say that I've done. He said, well, your attorney will explain it to you later on. Okay? Okay. That began a, a five-year indictment, five-year nightmare on the Patriot Act. I was never taken to trial. I never, I was, in five years, I was allowed one morning of testimony with two witnesses. The two witnesses were a chief of staff, former chief of staff for a congressional member of Congress, and my old friend Park Godfrey, who verified the 9-11 warnings that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to let you guys ask a lot of questions. And I know you're going to have a lot of questions. I'm going to do my best to answer as, as honestly as I can. I do not have all the answers, but I will tell you up front that I believe there was both the hijackings. And, and that does not mean that I'm right and you're wrong. I believe there were both hijackings and a controlled demolition scenario, and I'll explain to you how the whole thing fits together. And you may disagree, and that's okay if you disagree with me. But I can tell you, but, but, I'll, but, but, when you, but when you hear what I have to say, you'll understand why I've reached this conclusion. So I believe both of them happened, okay? Um, and, I, and it's also very important for you to know that as the 10-year anniversary of 9-11 comes up, you, I mean, no, no offense, but you guys have no idea what actually happened. This is like so much, the lies are so much bigger than what you know. And it's so much deeper, and it's so much more tragic once you have the truth. So on that note, uh, let me just take you to, uh, I'm actually going to start, I'm going to move you a little bit ahead to remember when George Bush and, and uh, uh, was, they were counting the votes in Florida. Okay, I'm going to take you back to November of 2000. Uh, they had not yet declared that uh, George Bush had won the election. We, I was having uh, meetings with the no full knowledge and permission of the CIA with, the Iraq, with Iraq's ambassador to the United Nations on resuming the weapons inspections. It is very important for you to understand that country, this, this story with 9-11 also ties in deeply to what happened with Iraq. And contrary to everything you were told, the Iraqis were not resistant to weapons inspections. They had a comprehensive agenda. The CIA had already a comprehensive agenda for resolving the entire conflict without war at all. And it involved weapons inspections, cooperation with anti-terrorism, and uh, major financial contracts for U.S. corporations and oil uh, and this would be developed over a period of time but we already had by November of 2000 we already had an agreement with the Iraqi government we had a framework agreement that was at that point it was undefined uh, not so well defined and and we had to make it defined but they had already consented to all of these things. They wanted peace with us. And um, so by February of 2001, the Iraqis had agreed to offer, uh, to invite the FBI to send a task force into Baghdad with authorization to conduct terrorism investigations and to make arrests of terror suspects. This is very important for you to understand. So this is like the, the background of what you have to know. Okay, in April of 2001, I was summoned to my, oh, this is already happening. The comprehensive peace framework, those discussions are already underway. And I am, at this point, the chief asset covering the Iraqi embassy and the Libya house, both of them, I do both of them, and Yemen and Syria and Egypt and Malaysia. But yeah, but. Iraq and Libya are my primary countries. And uh, so I'm a back channel, which means that the government, the U.S. government gives me messages to give the Iraqis, and then the Iraqis give